Morning Group of Life Church. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday service. It is wonderful to have you with us this morning. Today, I want to start by praying with you because I believe in the power of prayer. As we start to read from the Word of God, I want to pray and thank God for this moment. Heavenly Father, thank you for this moment. Thank you for an opportunity to meet and to share from the powerful word that comes from your mouth. Thank you that you have the power to change and transform our lives, even through the power of your word, because your word is sharp and active and powerful and able to discern between bone and marrow and soul and spirit. Thank you this morning that you shall help us and lift us up to your, to see your miraculous power. In Jesus' name, amen. Great. If you have been with us for any moment, for any season, you know that at Dream of Life Church, we love God, we love people, we love the Word of God. We are a contemporary Bible-based church, and we believe in the power of the Holy Spirit, we believe in the power of God, we believe in everything. And we've been having testimonies after testimonies of the power of God amongst us. And so thank you for those that are sharing testimonies. If you have a testimony, please do not hesitate to send an email to admin at riveroflife.org.za and we will hook you up. Thank you very much. So without much further ado, let me just share with you a few things about something that... um, It's been on my heart, and I tried to preach something else, but this came to my heart still. We've been uh, speaking the whole year on 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, which says in the TPT translation, it says, And then after your brief suffering, the God of all loving grace, who has called you to share in his eternal glory in Christ, will personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. Yes, he will set you firmly in place and build you up. And I believe that what God is talking about here is that what we're going through, the brief suffering that he talks about, is something that he doesn't allow us to go through on our own, but that God walks with us, God moves ahead of us. God prepares us and helps us to go through all of these brief sufferings that we go through because he's the God of all loving grace and he has called us to share in his eternal glory in Christ. Now, eternal glory in Christ isn't only speaking about things that are coming, isn't only speaking about things that are in the future of eternity, but it is also speaking about eternity that has already started because eternal life has already started. We are in it right now. And that eternal life is a miraculous life. That eternal life is a life that is marked with the presence of the power of God uh, with it. This is why God says here, he will personally and powerfully restore you and make you stronger than ever. He will personally, he's a God of miracles. He will personally, he's a God of power. He will powerfully because he is able to exercise and demonstrate his power. And the Bible tells me that he works powerfully according to his power that works in us. He's able to do much. He's able to accomplish much according to to the power that works in us. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, that power that makes things come back to life. But I'm getting ahead of myself right now. I want to say to you, this morning, I want you to believe that because of that which is within us, the spirit of Christ who is within us, because we have Christ in us, oh my goodness, because we have Christ in us, we are able to exercise, to live, and to experience the power of God, the miraculous power of God, the power that created the universe, the power that raised Christ from the dead. Because that power is within you, you, your nature, your character, your whole being becomes transformed, becomes different. It's no longer the same as everyone else's personality, character, and Make up because you are now made up of the living spirit of Christ in you that brings life to your dead spirit, dead soul made alive because of the power of God. This is why today I want to talk to you 
about believing God for a miracle. Believing God for a miracle. I won't be able to say everything. So watch out for next week's uh, sharing so that we get to the bottom of getting miracles from God. I want to read from the book of Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 25 in the Passion Translation. Can you believe it? Today I'm sharing from the Passion Translation for, for our main scripture. Now, Romans chapter 4, verse 17 to 25 says, that's what the scripture means when it says, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our example and father. For in God's presence, he believed that God can raise the dead and call into being things that don't even exist yet. Against all odds, when it looked hopeless, Abraham believed the promise and expected God to fulfill it. He took God at his word. And as a result, he became the father of many nations. God's declaration over him came to pass. You, your descendants, will be so many that they will be impossible to count. In spite of being nearly 100 years old when the promise of having a son was made, his faith was so strong that it could not be undermined by the fact that he and Sarah were incapable of conceiving a child. He never stopped believing God's promise, for he was made strong in his faith to, to father a child. And because he was mighty in faith and convinced that God had all the power needed to fulfill his promises, Abraham glorified God. Amen. So now, you can see why Abraham's faith was credited to his account as righteousness before God. And this declaration was not just spoken over Abraham, but also over us. For when, for when we believe and embrace the one who brought our Lord Jesus back to life, perfect righteousness will be accredited to our account as well. Jesus was handed over to be crucified for the forgiveness of our sins and was raised back to life to prove that he had made us right with God. Amen. God bless his word. Ah, uh, you know what? I am I am excited by the fact that we have already been given the word of our next season, which is faith, hope, and love. The greatest being love. And today, as I am speaking about believing God for a miracle, I want you to know that we are going to start by talking about faith, which really means believing God. Faith is believing God. And when we talk about believing God, faith is the way to please God, says Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, which says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Faith is what pleases God. But whatever is not of faith is sin. This is what the book of Romans chapter 14 verse 23 says to me. But whoever has doubts is condemned if they eat because their eating is not from faith. Everything that does not come from faith is sin. This is how important and powerful uh, faith is. If anything we did, if anything we do, if anything we're going to do, is not of faith, is not because of faith, it becomes sin. I don't know about you, but I think I have a lot of sins of things that I've done because I did not have faith or things that I did not do because I did not have faith in God. Faith is believing God. Faith is pleasing to God. But faith also is what determines what God can do in your life. What can God do? Is there anything too hard for God in your life? That is determined by the faith you have in him. Matthew chapter 9, verse 29. Jesus is healing some blind people. Then he touched their eyes and said, According to your faith, let it be done to you. According to who? According to what? According to your faith. The measure of what you will receive from God if you need a miracle from God is according to your faith. Your life 
can get so much from God according to your faith, according to how much you believe God. So, in that sense, it takes me to the next point where he says faith solves the impossible problems. So, when you have an impossibility before you, you need faith because only faith solves the impossible. Listen to Jesus' interaction here in Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. He replied, because you have so little faith, truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible for you because faith really solves the impossible. And many of us pray and we don't get answers. Or at least we don't get the answers that we expect or want. Matthew chapter 21 verse 22 says to me, the condition for answered prayer is in believing. When you believe, that's the condition that makes your prayer be answered. What are you believing? You're not believing yourself. You're not believing your lies. You're not believing your own imagination. You must believe God. You must believe his word. You must believe his promises. You must believe his character. And then you will receive from him. Matthew 21 verse 22. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. So prayer is powerful. But prayer is only powerful if you believe in the God you are praying to. If you believe his word, if you believe him, if you believe his promises, if you believe, you will receive whatever you pray for because you believe, because you have faith. And so, as we are speaking about receiving a miracle from God, believing God for a miracle, John chapter 14, verse 12, emphasizes that faith is the basis of all miracles. Faith is the basis of all miracles. John 14, verse 12, very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. This is Jesus Christ making a promise to you that he is able to do a miracle and make you do miracles that are greater than the ones that he did if you believe. Whoever believes, the miracles that I do, that one who believes me will do even greater miracles. Hallelujah. I want your faith to start rising right now. As you hear what the word of God is saying to you, as you hear the promises of God for your life, the miracles of God are possible. But as we are looking at miracles, I want you to know that miracle is when God's intervention in the natural has no other explanation except that God did it by his own supernatural power. Of course, everything that we see came from the supernatural hand of God. But there are times when God's direct intervention in our moment, in our current situation, it cannot be explained in any other way except that it is God who intervened, did something that becomes what we call miracles. The book of Romans chapter 4 verse 17 tells me that God does two types of miracles. Let's read Romans 4 verse 17. It says that's what the scripture means when it says, I have made you the father of many nations. He is our example and father for God, in God's presence he believed that God can raise the dead and to and call into being things that don't even yet exist. So God does two kinds of miracles. One, he gives life to the dead. This is the God who resurrects health. This, this is a miracle of God where sometimes when you're not well, God brings health back into your being. I remember just uh, the beginning of the week, I wasn't feeling too great. You know what? There are times when you can take your usual medication, you take your usual supplements and everything, 
and still it feels like there's no change. When you call on the name of the Lord and you sense something and you think, oh, it's my mind, God is able to intervene. I think we have fallen into the trap of rationalizing, explaining away everything. God still does healing miracles. He resurrects health. He resurrects relationships. God gives life to dead emotions. He gives, he revives even a dead church. It's, that's the kind of miracle he does. Number one, he gives life to the dead. Number two, he calls into being that which does not exist yet. In the book of Genesis chapter one, we read that and God said, and God said, and whatever God was saying, it happened. And it had never existed before, but it began to exist because God said it, because God spoke it into being. By the power of his word, he speaks things into existence. So God gives life to the dead, but God calls, speaks into being that which does not yet exist. Those are the two miracles of God that I would like to encourage you to look out for, to believe God for, to seek for. And this morning, I am going to do only part one briefly of what I want you to know about believing God for a miracle. Because when we get deeper into part two, I want you to have this in mind and have grasped this explanation. What are some of the steps that we sometimes see when there is a miracle about to happen? Number one miracle that I believe that when God is about to do a miracle in your life, when God is planning a miracle in your life, he brings a dream into your life. He brings an expectation. He brings a desire into you, a strong desire, a strong inclination for something and something that seems impossible, something that seems wonderful, something that would be uh, a, a solution to a situation that looks difficult. In the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, we see what God did because we're going to read and study the work that God did in the life of Abraham or Abraham. It says in the book of Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, that the Lord had said to Abraham, go from your country, your people, and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples of the earth on earth will be blessed through you. Now, God plants this into Abraham. Abraham was still called Abraham. Now, Abraham is in the land of Ur of the Chaldees with his fathers. They had been worshipping idols. But God calls him out of that life. And he says, go from your country, from your people, from your father's household to a land I will show you. That is impossible. I've never been there. And I go just guided by a voice of a God I have never seen before. And God puts a dream. God puts a promise into Abraham's heart. He says, I will make you into a great nation. What? I am Abraham. I have, I, I, I have a wife who is barren. How am I going to become a great nation? He says, and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. In those days, you must remember that it was not common for a person who was childless to be called great because people counted having children as something of a blessing and something of giving greatness to you. And the more children you had, the greater people counted you. He says, I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. Imagine such great promises, such great dreams that God is putting into Abraham. And Abraham has to do something about something like this when God speaks something like this. And I'm saying to you this morning that the same thing is true about you. That when God starts making promises, when God starts showing you things, when God starts opening up your mind and your imagination about things that he wants to do through you, about things that he wants to do in you, I want you to know that it is time for you to take some action. 
Because some of us have put faith for things to happen that didn't start with a word from God, that didn't start with a dream from God, that didn't start with anything that God wants to do in your life, but it started because we wanted to be like other people. We wanted to copy. We wanted to have what other people have. Out of envy, out of jealousy, we begin to imagine things and dream of things that are not from God's heart. He said, the closer you are to God, the better your relationship is with God, the better your dreams become. The more closer they are to God's dreams about you. Remember Psalm 37 that tells us that if you delight yourself in the Lord, He will give you the desires of your heart. He will implant in you desires. He will give you the desires of your heart. A miracle must start with a dream, with a promise, with a prompting from God, then it becomes a true miracle because it is starting with a prompting, with a desire of God in you. But step number two is that when a miracle is, is instigated inside of you, the dream has been started, then you need to do number two, take a decision. We see Abraham making a decision in Genesis chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. So Abraham went. Abraham went. God didn't speak and then Abraham remained just thinking, what a powerful word. Abraham went as the Lord had told him and Lord went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He took his wife Sarai, his nephew Lot, all the possessions they had accumulated and the people they had acquired in Haran. And they set out for the land of Canaan and they arrived there. Listen, God put a dream in Abraham. And Abraham took the dream that God had given him and he put it into action by making a decision. There are people whose dreams, whose miracles are on hold. They are in park mode. Because God said, move, this is what I'm going to do in your life. And they stood and they withheld and waited for God to do everything. They didn't make a decision to go, do, say, and be what God had asked them to be. I'm one of those people. I lived many years in resistance to God. When God told me to move, I was told at a very young age to move and get into the ministry. But I resisted. God had made promises that he would sustain me. He would look after me. But I resisted. And I said, I will not go. I have, I have a determination. I want to work in the corporate world. So God says, fine, work in the corporate world. But I will use that as training ground to get you into the place that I want you to get into. Until the time when I had to move from my home country to come to South Africa, it was, I moved because I believed God was sending me out. God was showing me where to go next. The time was, was, was ready. The time was then. And God said, now go. And I went. I had to make a decision. For a few months, I left my family behind. And I had to move. And I went into a place. I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything to hold on to. I just had a friend who gave me a place to stay. That is all I had. What was going to happen next? I was waiting for God. And here I am today. God has shown me great miracles. God has shown me mighty things. God has shown me amazing revelations of his ability to make sure that his miracle comes to pass. So when God gives you a dream, you need to make a decision and move. And then we see in Abraham's life, that many a time, when God has put a dream in you, there comes the season of delay. The dream followed by the decision is usually followed by a season of delay. It's that delay that causes a lot of us so much trouble, problems, and we collapse. In Genesis chapter 15, verse 1 to 6, the Bible says, After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abraham said, Sovereign Lord, 
What can you give me since I remain childless? And the one who will inherit my estate is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abraham said, you have given me no children. So a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. He took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. Now, you must remember, by the time God is speaking to Abraham, Abraham left when he was 75 years old when he was given these promises. But at the age of 99, imagine the age of 99, almost 25 years later, he still hasn't seen the promise. How many of us can make, wait for a promise for 20 years? For 20 months? For 20 weeks? 20 days? People struggle to wait for a promise for 20 minutes. That period of delay is a dangerous very significant and key period in waiting for your miracle to happen. Can I tell you, when I moved from Zimbabwe to South Africa in 2003, actually end of 2002, I had been moving, believing I would go into Bible school and get into ministry within a short time. But from 2003, I only started ministry in 2014. That's when I got into ministry. That period of delay. Very important. We will speak about it. We will speak about the significance and what to do about it next time. But for now, I want you to notice that the period of delay is a dangerous period. Because that period needs leads to the next point I want to talk about. It leads to the place of desperation. Where desperation now fuels and is also fueled by doubt starting to creep in. Did I hear God? Is this really the dream from God? Did God say it this way or did I hear wrong? And then you get into the problems where the desperation now is attended to by difficulty. And because of that difficulty, it increases your desperation. Because things are difficult, you become desperate now to say, if only God's dream could come, the difficulties I'm facing right now would be solved because this is not the will of God for me. In that desperation, Abraham found himself taking a detour. There was a detour that came into his life. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 1 and 2, we see the detour. Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. Doubt, the difficulty that is attended to it, the tests, and then the desperation now leads you to take a detour from the way that God had said things are going to come. Then you start looking for other avenues to make things happen. You try to help God as if He was incapable. Of doing the impossible. Do not be tempted to try and usurp the authority of God by taking over and helping God by doing what God has not told you to do. Abraham had not been told that he would have children through uh, a, a, a slave girl. God said to him, your own flesh and blood with your wife. That was God's promise. But here is, we find Abraham agreeing with Sarah to do something that God had not told them to do. 
That was not God's instruction. That was not God's way. That was not God's prescription for this for the, for their need. But let me give you just this because today I'm just giving you these few steps. Then we get deeper into them and the solutions and getting to the place of miracles again next time. So desperation now leads people to get to a place of a dead end sometimes. You see, the dead end comes when God puts you in a place where you must prove to yourself and to God that you are pursuing God, not God's gifts, not just the promise, but you're pursuing God himself. You see, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17, we hear the word of God saying, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had embraced the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. There was a dead end. Because sometimes dead ends come in the journey to your miracle so that they test your resolve and your faith in God. Do you believe God in the face of a dead end? In the face of an impossibility, will you believe God? Are you seeking God or are you seeking only his gift? Because if you're seeking only his gift, your heart will be tempted and your heart will look for solutions to just fulfill what you want, not fulfill what God wants. Because you want more what God wants to give you than you want to please God. You see, dead ends, seemingly dead ends, should not convince us that God has abandoned his plan in our lives. I worked for a company in Pretoria that was retrenching me. And it didn't seem like there was any opening for me to get into ministry. Look, being retrenched three times, rehired, retrenched, rehired, retrenched, and you still believe that God is going to do what he promised to do. You would think, okay, maybe now because I am unemployed, this is where someone will come and say, oh, you are unemployed, so you are available. Here is a place of ministry. No. I had to be rehired, and I was working by the time God opened the door for ministry, I had to resign from a position of work to, to, to go and become a pastor. I'm saying to you, there are going to be places in your journey to receiving your miracle where it looks like the miracle is dead. Where it looks like you have, you have, you have to give away what God said he was giving you. You have to give away what God has promised you as an inheritance or as your avenue for getting into the place where you are supposed to get to, to your destination. You know, sometimes God will bless you with finances. And then he will ask you to give them away. When you had prayed earnestly and said, God, I'm desperate, I need this money. And then when God gives it to you, then he says, give it away. And when you give it away, because you want to obey God more than you want money, I guarantee you, God will always make a plan for you. Sometimes it's through pain. Sometimes it's difficult. It's not through the way that we expect, but he will make a plan for you. God always makes a plan so that his miracle come to pass. And so, if you pass the test, if you are able to lay your Isaac on the altar when God has made a promise, remember the, the thing that will give you power to be able to lay your Isaac on the altar is because the Isaac that you are holding came through a dream that God gave you. If you have an Isaac that you have created yourself through Hagar, it's an Ishmael. It's not an Isaac. And when you lay an Ishmael on the altar, you do not expect God to rise up and provide for that. God will provide when you lay your 
your eyes on the altar. A discussion for another day. But the next step after you pass the dead end stage is the stage of your deliverance, of the delivery of the miracle. In Genesis chapter 22, verse 13 to 14, the Bible says, Abraham looked up and there in the thicket, he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the, la the Lord will provide. And to this day, it is said, on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. We have sung the song, Jireh. Jehovah, Jireh, this is where Abraham made that declaration that God is the God who provides. He gave me a dream. He gave me a promise. And God has provided for that promise. Gave me a dream. I made the decision of faith and I walked the journey into the promised Canaan land. There was a delay. I didn't possess it immediately. I had to run to Egypt sometimes. I had to run and become a sojourner and I had to stay and live in tents as though I was just a visitor. And there was delays in the promise of a son so that I could be the father of many nations. But I, out of desperation and doubt and difficulty, made a detour. But God restored me and gave me Isaac. But then I got to the dead end when it seemed like the Isaac was about to be sacrificed and completely destroyed. And the dream was about to die. But God provided. The God who provides always comes through for those that believe in him. Faith is believing that God is who he says he is and he does what he says he will do. And this morning, and I'm challenging every believer, every child of God, that you draw closer to God, that you start believing him, that you decide to do what he has asked you to do, that whenever you face delays, you remember the dream came from God, your decision was of faith, and therefore no need for you to live in the land of desperation because of doubt, difficulty and because of the, the temptation to detour to detour and go via the route that God didn't ask you for. Now I'm asking you, I am asking you, please believe God. Please trust God. Please do not allow disturbances, desperation, doubt and every kind of testing to cause you to stop believing that God is able to bring a miracle into your life. This is the first of two messages I'm going to preach to you. I am hoping that your faith is starting to get stirred up to believe that the same God who raised Christ from the dead is the same God who's going to raise the dead dreams that he gave you. Those that are at the dead end stage where they look like they have died. Remember, I said God has two types of miracles. He, he raises the dead. He puts life back into the dead. And two, he calls things that do not exist into existence. Whatever your situation is like, whatever your situation, whether it looks dead or it looks non-existent, God is able to bring life to the dead, and call things that are not as though they were. May you receive this inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Father, impart upon us the spirit of faith, the spirit of trust, the spirit of, of believing, so that we may believe you and trust in you, that nothing is too hard for you. Nothing indeed is too difficult for you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray that what we are facing right now, may we declare with our mouth that because God has said it, it will happen. Because we believe him, it will happen. Because we do not mind desperation and delays, it will happen. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, give us dreams. Draw us closer that we may hear your voice. 
and your spirit as he implants dreams within us and grants us the strength to pursue them relentlessly in Jesus' name. If you don't know Jesus Christ, you can't follow all these things because you need to be connected to him. Talk to us. We will, we will guide you into this relationship where you have a God, a divine father who leads you from dream to deliverance by his own way. In Jesus' name, amen.